and welcome to What Goes Up, a weekly markets podcast. My name is Mike Regan. I'm a senior editor at Bloomberg. And I'm Valdana Hayek, a cross-asset reporter with Bloomberg. And this week on the show, well, anyone who has spent any time really studying the stock market is probably familiar with the old cliche, sell in May and go away and come back on St. Ledger's Day. That's September 15th for those who aren't familiar with their 16th century English saints. Well, May is only a couple weeks away, and the stock market has gotten off to a rip-roaring start this year. So is this a good year to follow that old advice in the cliche? We'll talk to a market strategist who says, hey, don't wait, sell now. He'll explain why he's expecting a drop of as much as about 22% from current levels in the S&P 500. But first, Fildan, I have to ask. Ask away. <laughs> you know it's going to be a strange one. when what I What is it? I have you ever owned a pair of Air Jordans? No. No. Why? But they're very trendy now, even if you don't play hoops. No. I used to buy them when I when I was still a basketball. Uh, Just because the idea is like you, th- they'll make you a better player. Well, they're good. Yeah, they're good basketball sneakers. No, but they're trendy now just as a fashion item. Oh. Uh, and in fact, shout out to Mario D'Angelo, a uh, frequent listener, pen pal of ours, who pointed out a, a crazy thing for this week. It's not my crazy thing. Oh, good, because I saw it. You did, yeah. yeah. I know. That's why it's not, because I knew you, you knew the price. Yeah, I saw yeah. it, because he sent it to me, too. A, p- a pair of, they. well, it's this is a BBC story, so they call them trainers. I'd have never heard Air <laughs> Jordans refer to as trainers, except in the BBC, but pair of trainers once worn by basketball legend Michael Jordan himself. So Air Jordans worn in a game by Air Jordan himself sold for $2.2 million at auction, which sounds like a lot, but it's actually less than what they were expecting, which I think is a bearish signal. Oh. Bearish signal? Wow. Maybe. Well, we've been waiting for this, right? Like, it's always some obnoxious number <laughs> every time we, we are thinking about, like, auctions. They were expected to go as high as $4 million, only wow. went for 2.2. 2. So oh my gosh. Um, I think that's a good segue to our guest who's a, l- a little bit in the bearish camp, even though- He is, yeah. I think our first guest ever to join us from Honolulu, so- Yeah, I think he might be. I'm so hard, jealous of him. Hard to be too pessimistic in Honolulu. And but. he's there for a conference? Like, do you think Bloomberg would send us to Honolulu? It, maybe you, probably not me. Yeah. yeah. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to bring him in. It's Troy Gajewski, Chief Market Strategist at FS Investment. Troy, I've been wanting to get you on the podcast for forever. So thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, it's great to be on. Looking forward to it. Yeah, I'm so happy to have you on. So maybe just to start, you can tell us about FS Investments. Yeah, so FS Investments was really founded uh, by Michael Foreman with the mission to democratize alternative investments and you know, bring strategies that had only been available to the ultra, ultra high net worth individuals or, um, you know, mega institutions like CalPERS or Yale's endowment, and then take those strategies and package them in a way that was readily accessible with much lower uh, standards in terms of size, in terms of liquidity, in terms of fees. And so over time, we've evolved from being mainly focused on middle market corporate lending packaged through BDCs, some of which are listed to a broad suite of solutions that range from, you know, daily liquid multi-strategy funds packaged in a, a, a mutual fund wrapper. We run the largest public non-traded uh, senior secured commercial real estate lending REIT. We've recently combined with portfolio advisors to bring private equity secondaries to individuals uh, in a very user-friendly way. So the mission of the firm remains the same, democratizing alternatives. We're just pleased and feel very fortunate that, you know, these strategies are so timely in an environment like we're going now. And, you know, when, when we think of last year, there were really five alternative strategies that did well from credit REITs, multi-strats, equity REITs, uh, perpetual BDCs and managed future CTAs. And, and two of them have a richer opportunity set in 23 than 22. And those happen to be two of our flagship uh, alternative solutions. So we're, we're we're somewhat fortunate, somewhat lucky, but we think the the business model has served our clients and ourselves well. Well, uh, Trey, let's talk about that uh, idea that the market is is sort of due for a come come up. And so you uh, sent us some notes before the podcast, and you say you see a scenario where the S and P could drop as low as thirty two hundred, and so a twenty something percent drop from here is the sell in May work this year? I guess is the the question. Yeah, it would be incredibly stunning if if selling in May or, or selling prior to May, like I said, <laughs> you know, if there's there's no reason to wait. You know, it's not like you're going to leave ten percent upside on the table. It doesn't work out. And, and if you think about, first of all, 
the strongest rallies have always been in bear markets, right? Bear market rallies are nothing new. Uh, they happen all the time. Usually they're driven by technical factors. And then there's a narrative that's uh, put together to justify it. Um, the, the more recent one was that, yeah, like inflation is going to slow enough that the Fed won't have to hike anymore. And then we're going to have a recession and somehow that's going to cause the Fed to cut rapidly. But recessions aren't bad for revenue or earnings. And it, it really makes very little sense. So ultimately, if you think of where we are, you know, multiples compressed last year significantly. We got down to 15.75 times forward earnings. We've popped back up to let's call it 18.4 to 18.6. Let's go with the rosy assumption that we bottomed in terms of multiples because uh, multiples tend to bottom before earnings. And if you look forward and just take 18.6 down to call it 16 or 17 times trough earnings at 200, that gets you to that 32 to 3,400. And you know, that, that makes a lot of sense to us just from a, a historical uh, analysis perspective. When you, We've always thought that this bear market would be meaningfully worse than the 2018 correction or some of the shocks we had in the post uh, GFC period, but not as bad as we had uh, from 2002 and also the financial crisis. And, and so we always thought 30 to 40 percent was a rational range. Um, obviously, that uh, math on 16 to 17 times trough earnings of 200 takes us down about 29 to 33 from the uh, the peak in the beginning of, of uh, 2022 before things got really ugly. And so bottom line is, is if you're an investor today and you have still elevated levels of aid in your portfolio, you, you haven't gotten the message yet that bear markets occur, they don't uh, end magically overnight. This is a golden opportunity to use this bear market rally to de-risk in advance of potentially very painful losses over the next six, nine to 12 months. And you know, I, this is a side topic, but it, it it completely stuns me still at how much inertia there is in asset allocation and, and how even when faced with clear evidence that the risk reward of equities is poor, there's very little capital that flows out into strategies that actually have a fighting chance to make you five to eight percent instead of potentially losing, you know, 15 to 25. So, so I think if I were to take sort of the side of the the bulls out there today, they would say, well, you know, inflation is coming down. I think the, the CPI print this week was, what, 5% uh, versus 6% uh, last month, something like that. Um, and that Fed reaction function to Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank was so lightning quick. They created that term lending facility. The discount windows open wide. They're sort of reintroducing liquidity, expanding their balance sheet again. You know, I, I think it boils down to the kids on Twitter would say the, mo- the money printer's going burr again, you know, which is a very oh, obviously an oversimplified reason to be bullish for stocks. But nonetheless, it, it, there's a lot of believers in that, that notion um, that the, the, you know, Maybe we get one or two more rate hikes from the Fed, but that balance sheet is is open for business again. How do you sort of respond to that bullish take uh, these days? Yeah, look, so we've always said throughout this period that, you know, the probability of the Fed cutting significantly or reprinting money was exceptionally low until they broke things, yeah. right? And <laughs> real things. And, and so obviously you had some poorly managed banks um, in terms of asset liability mismatch in terms of duration. And, and they did respond. And, and that's why, quite frankly, up until last week's data came out on the Fed re-shrinking their balance sheet, we, we kind of moved from a narrative of, all right, it's clear that money supply is contracting at the fastest pace in history, balance sheets being drained, Fed's got you know at, at least two hikes at that point, maybe three to four left in them, uh, everything's going down. And then for a brief window of time, you, you move to like, are, is the Fed uh, doing QE while they're doing QT? Can, can you hike the front end while expanding the balance sheet? What, what does this mean for money supply? What does this mean for, for the forward trajectory of, of, uh, of multiples? But then, of course, now that we have more data, you've seen that the balance sheet has started to shrink again, which obviously has negative ramifications for money supply. The Fed will more than likely only hike one to two more times. But advocating that the Fed is going to come to the rescue prior to having more downside pain in the economy and markets, we think is very naive at this stretch of the uh, game. And you do have to give 
the Fed, FDIC, and Treasury a lot of credit. Obviously, missed the problem, but they addressed it very rapidly. And it does look like they've so far ring fenced the problem in, in a number of problematic banks, but kept the system rather safe. So, you know, I think we've really for th two or three weeks it was very confusing. Uh, you had conflicting narratives. Uh, you had conflicting data on on how this would play out. But now it's back to the same path of shrinking balance sheet, several more, you know, one to two more hikes. And that just means multiples are way, way too high. And, and by the way, just to go from a historical perspective, you know, when you go back to, you know, let, let's again assume we bottomed at 15 and a half to 16 times forward earnings. Remember the, the, the multiple bottom in the GFC was, was nine, yeah. right? So that's nowhere near the pain that we saw then. And the multiple bottom coming out of 2002 was 15, right? We went from 25 times to 15. So in in some ways, like our forward view, we don't even consider bearish. We just consider it like realistic, right? And, and arguing that an 18 or 19 multiple uh, is is uh, rational in, in this type of environment makes very, very little sense to us. I'm wondering what you make. We had the Fed minutes come out this week and the, one of the headlines was the Fed, Fed staff is projecting a mild recession starting later in 2023. Aren't we not supposed to hear from the Fed saying that they're expecting any type of downturn? After some of their missteps on uh, describing inflation trans as transitory, I give them a lot of credit for being fairly honest and straightforward that the the end game here is a recession, right? That's how you break inflation. There's really no other way to to get through this cycle and bring inflation down to two or three percent, which is you know their their target probably should be three now instead of two, but they're still stuck on two, so that's where we're headed. And you know, the, the way we describe that to investors is we, we've really been mired in this ugly environment for quite some time. And by ugly, we mean, you know, inflation simmering, spreading to services and, and labor. Fed has to hike a lot, shrink the balance sheet. Uh, everything's going down. You know, the good news is that we were certainly always going to get out of that and, and not stay have a 70 style stagflationary outcome. If for no other reason, the money supply was already shrinking and the Fed was behind the curve, but caught up fast. But the bad news is, as we leave the ugly, the next stop is almost certainly what we call the bad, which is a classic old school recession. And, you know, when you think of what's kept us out of it so far, it's been the remarkable resilience of the labor market um, and the U.S. consumer, which has basically single handedly kept uh, the global economy afloat here. And, and, you know, as the labor market cracks and we're starting to see signs of that, particularly in withholding tax data, um, and, and layoffs move from, you know, very high paying tech jobs and to lesser extent financial services to the broader economy, there just won't be enough support from consumption to keep us out of recession. So, you know, that is the next stop. Uh, you know, at this point, the soonest we could see that is really uh, late Q2, early Q3 uh, of this year. The latest is Q1 of 24. And then, you know, kind of circling back to the, the question on, on the bullish argument, in some ways you could justify holding on to assets in a meaningful way that have uh 20% downside. If you thought coming out of that, you know, hey, the next three years, you're going to make 80 to hundred percent. But remember the next fed cutting cycle is going to look a lot like the mirror image of the last hiking cycle where they hiked very, very gingerly from 15 to 18. And they did that to make sure that they'd slayed the disinflation deflation demon and this time, again, barring a, an apocalyptic economic outcome or market calamity, they're going to cut very, very slowly. So, so you're not going to see the multiple expansion from, say, you know, later this year, early 24, uh, over the next five, six, six years that we saw from 09 to 21. It'll be much more like the 02 to 07 bull market, where you, you, you came into that bull market at 15 times forward earnings, you ended that bull market at 15 times forward earnings. What is behind the rally right now? Is it just that people are thinking about, uh, you know, the Fed potentially pausing or and and or cutting rates down the line, and how we square that with why they'd be cutting rates to begin with? Like something would be bad <laughs> happening with the economy, right? At the same time, yeah. So that again, that it's been really stunning that you, you've had folks articulate a narrative that. The Fed will cut and cut aggressively because we're going to have a recession, and that's somehow good for revenue and earnings, right? I mean, like I, I just don't understand that for life of me. And 
And, and I think this gets back to a, another point of where, you know, bear market rallies are typically driven by technicals, right? Uh, there's short covering starts, there's uh, gamma hedging by options uh, trading desks. Then you have systematic trend followers or traders hop on, you know, the bear market rally drives it higher. And then the industry, and by industry, I mean, you know, strategists, CIOs, uh, analysts try to figure out a way to justify it. And sometimes that justification makes no sense at all. And, and as you guys know, the, you know, typically, you know, recessions cause at least a 20% drop in earnings. All, all, we're, all we did with our, our math before was, was say 10% drop, uh, which is a lot less than 20. So it certainly could be, could be worse. But yeah, the, the idea that a recession uh, and a Fed that's forced to pivot because of it late will be uh, will drive a positive outcome for equity markets is it, just borderline bizarre. Uh, you know, Trey, I think one shoe that everyone seems to be waiting uh, to drop next is the in the credit markets and the you know the, the supply of credit, and it's kind of a hard thing to really gauge in real time. You know, the Fed reports, the H8 report and, and things like that are usually a, a week or two old. The senior loan officer survey, I think the next one's not till uh, the middle of May or something like that. How do you look at sort of the conditions in the credit market to determine whether they're tightening up in, in real time? And is there any evidence yet that it's come? I mean, obviously, we've had all these rate hikes and the, the failure of a few banks clearly must be making loan officers nervous, you know, are, are you, is there anywhere you can point to now and say it started or is it still just kind of bracing for, for that to happen? Yeah. So, so look, I think um, it really depends on the market. Uh, I, I would go back to when you think about when high yield and IG spread started to widen in like Q1, Q2 of last year, it took until May of last year for senior commercial real estate lending spreads to start widening. Then it took until say August for uh, middle market corporate private loan spreads to start widening. Um, and then obviously in this risk on period, you've had spreads tighten back in liquid markets that hasn't happened yet in, in private markets. We don't expect it to, but more directly, and this gets back to that confusing kind of narrative around what was going on for a three week period. You, you saw obviously the stresses in the banks during a time where loan officers were already constraining credit creation. So credit standards were already tightening. And then you got this pop up in in actually commercial bank lending, a really quick pop up, and it's like, well, like, like what the heck's <laughs> going on here? Oh, I get it. Everybody's drawing down revolvers, like grabbing cash while they can, right, grabbing right. credit while they can, and then you know, of course, we expected that to roll over, and that's exactly what's happened now. The past two weeks, you're directly seeing evidence of the banking situation in regional community banks impacting broader commercial lending. So the big banks are doing more, but the smaller banks are doing far less. And then, you know, also from a, a mortgage availability standpoint, you, you'd already seen uh, agency RMBS spreads widen dramatically because of QT, which was further constraining funding to the housing market. That's actually one of our, uh, we have a really unique uh, exposure in our multi-strategy fund to take advantage of that, that we can maybe talk about later. But you, you're certainly seeing now ample evidence, right, that credit conditions are tightening, which further reinforces the, the concept of how in the world can we possibly avoid recession the next six, nine, 12 months? It, it, it's really mission impossible. You know, we always thought the probability of the Fed magically threading the needle and guiding us to, uh, you know, a five or five and a half percent unemployment without a recession was at tops was a 10 percent probability. Now it just looks, uh, you know, virtually zero. If we wanted to get a read through of the what's happening in the wake of the turmoil with the banks in the stock market. Do you think the small cap space would be the place to look with the idea being that maybe smaller companies have less access to banks and potentially maybe would also be a place where we'd start to see some layoffs as a result of the credit crunch? It's interesting you say that because, you know, smid cap or small cap factor exposures were already really cheap coming into the year relative to, to large and mega. And uh, we actually had that factor trade on. But as soon as the banking crisis started, it's like, all right, like, you know, cheap things can get cheaper or, or relationships can get more out of whack. So we, we blew out of that really quick. And uh, ultimately, what, what it does is it delays any 
compression of that that spread, right? And that's again when you think about just locally more what's happened to to the Nasdaq or you know uh, Apple and Microsoft in particular, you know the, the last remaining you know fangs that are still performing as as you'd expect as growth companies that aren't grossly overvalued. You know, a lot of that gets back to the fact that, you know, those have more pristine balance sheets. And when you think about smaller cap companies that are clearly more exposed to the domestic economy, that are clearly more reliant upon, you know, local small bank financing, um, it's it, it's unlikely that that situation improves. And, you know, I would say one cross current to that, which is fascinating to us, uh, just given our footprint in private credit, both in commercial real estate and, and middle market corporate loans is, you know, the the window now for private lenders to take market share from banks at wider spreads it, it has expanded far more than, again, we would have imagined six weeks ago, right? In that we expected banks to retrench. They had been. We expected better opportunities to service the needs of those that had to roll loans. We'd already seen uh, many companies uh, doing what I politely call bankruptcy prevention dip loans to, to reduce the risk of going bankrupt in the event of uh, a, a recession. Um, and, and now that's just even escalating more. So you think about like commercial real estate lending, there's about 1.8 trillion loans that are going to roll this year and the next three years. And, and there's just less financing options for those borrowers. Uh, and, and so that creates a better opportunity if you have dry powder to lend into a mini liquidity vacuum. And it's really the best time to be a lender that we've seen since the global financial crisis. Uh, and, you know, fortunately, that's one of the three silver linings of this environment. We, we expect a recession. Yeah, obviously, the weakest links in the financial system have cracked, uh, but the system is still strong. I'd like to get into that, uh, the idea of commercial real estate a little bit. You know, you mentioned uh, you guys manage a, a real estate investment trust, uh, especially the property sector REITs have, uh, or the office REITs uh, have, have really just been annihilated this year um, to the point where, you know, it's gotten so ugly that it, it starts looking pretty, I think, to, to a lot of investors. You know, these yields are are pretty eye popping. Are there REITs and commercial real estate investments in general where there's, you know, babies being thrown out with the bathwater right now? Are there certain sectors, certain areas that that are attractive to you? Well, so I, I think it really depends, right, for for you know, our franchise, we're senior lenders. So the market's coming to us. You you had this uh, long period of time where you had the headwind of, uh, you know, front end rates were extremely low. And, and what we do are, are floating rate loans. So when the Fed never hikes and then they hike a little and then they cut again and, and they yeah. cut back to zero, you obviously don't have that same degree of income you'd expected. And then in a world where you had money supply ballooning, in general, spreads in every credit strategy were, were tight um, uh, relative to a normalized environment. And obviously, that's changed significantly. Uh, so the opportunities to lend, particularly in, in multifamily or industrial, where the fundamentals look really good, it's just, you know, spreads were too tight or LTVs were higher than we would have liked. You know, LTVs are dropping, um, have dropped materially and spreads have widened. You know, when you, when you think about you know, office specifically. So there's obviously a big difference between small footprint, secondary, tertiary, you know, cities in in uh, in the Sun Belt or in the Smile States and major metro, you know, office in New York, San Francisco, Chicago. The way we see that playing out, and we've been articulating this for about 18 months, is it's going to be a, a repeat of the slow motion train wreck that we had in bricks and mortar retail. Right. So bricks and mortar retail. It was a was a real credit concern, a real owner operator concern for for years, and you know ultimately uh, that cured itself with with a surprisingly low amount of losses. Um, but major metro office, as you know, it's very difficult to repurpose major towers into multifamily given the footprints, um, and there's just going to be a substantial amount of wealth destroyed uh, by owner operators. I'd say we we we'd be cautious on trying to play any short-term bounce in any equity REIT that's listed as we're going into a recession. But clearly, as that happens, yields will go even higher. And at some point, you know, two to three years from now, we'll start to see real estate broadly rebound, at least stabilize at a lower valuation. So we're, we're always ones to say, in an environment like this, 
um, what you really want to do is focus on strategies that have a bright opportunity that happen to have gotten at least slightly better because of what's going on in the banking system and financial markets, as opposed to trying to be a hero in, in time of bottom in, in any particular uh, security or asset class that could have meaningfully more downside from here. That, that's interesting. So you think it could be another two to three years before we really see see the bottom in in office rates, especially, I, I I asked because we had a headline out today. Uh, J.P. Morgan orders all managing directors back into the office five days a week. Is it not return to work alone is not enough to to solve the issue with with office rates in the short term? I guess. Well, again, I, I don't want to speak specifically about any any one security. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but bottom line is the the trends of outward migration from certain areas of the country <laughs> had been in place for quite some time. That was obviously amplified by the pandemic and, you know, return to work for certain mega institutions alone won't necessarily cause uh, any particular rebound in valuations that you can point to with a great deal of specificity. I would say, though, again, if you think of real estate broadly, and we have this term called galactic mean reversion, where you know, after years of outrageous asset outperformance um, versus the real economy and the labor market, you know, we started to go through, again, not another lost decade or 1964 to 1982, but a period where financial assets would, would perform poorly um, and the labor market would be surprisingly resilient. And that's actually played out even better than we thought. But it wasn't just about, you know, financial assets. Real estate also had a hockey stick like move, you know, residential real estate, you know, up 35 to 42 percent commercial, you know, uh, not quite as much upside. And, and so naturally, when when financing rates go up and borrowing costs go up, you're going to have some degree of give back. You know, whenever an asset class has a hockey stick like move, you know, obviously you give back some of those gains. And, and, and so for broader real estate, whether it's resi or commercial, all we're going through is a healthy correction. Right. You're taking out the excess in valuations. Uh, the difference with major metro office is that that's a, that's a sustained secular problem. Right. That that's not like, hey, I, I probably overpaid for a multifamily property at the peak and I'm gonna my IRR is gonna be a lot lower the next seven years than I hoped. Risk of default is non existent. I'm just gonna make less money owning the property. Um, those those are areas where there'll be realized losses to, from owner operators that in some cases will bleed through into the banking system. So in your notes, you said, trim your equity exposure and embrace democratized alts because the time for the right alts is still now. I'm wondering then what you would put on that list of the right alts. So there's really three silver linings in this environment. One, 70 style outcome was always at incredibly low probability. It's non-existent now. Two, repeat of a GFC, given how strong underwriting standards have been, you know, where the... Uh, uh, the excess liquidity is still in the banking system, not in every bank, but in the banking system. You know, we still have over three trillion of excess slash total reserves versus forty to fifty billion coming into GFC. But the third is that alternatives have been democratized, right? You, you didn't have fixed income to protect you last year, like you did in two thousand and two, or even the GFC, but you had uh, a series of democratized alternative strategies that actually performed really well last year relative to markets. And you know, th those five categories, simplicity, not all inclusive were credit REITs, multi-strategy funds, equity REITs, fully invested perpetual BDCs, and CTAs managed futures. So last year, those five groups all performed very well relative to what was going on in fixed income and equity markets where it was a, a horror show, as you know. So the difference this year and why we evolved the message from the time for alts is now to the time for the right alts is still now is of those five strategies, two have, we believe, materially better opportunities, two have a darker outlook, and the fifth, it's not necessarily that you're, you're guaranteed to lose money, it's just the history of client allocations to C CTAs or trend-following strategies is that people buy tops and sell bottoms, rinse, repeat, do it again, very, very difficult to time. So. You know, multi-strats, at least we know, have higher income now um, than they did coming into 2022. So all things being equal, if you can generate the same amount of alpha, again, it's an if, not a, not a guarantee. You're starting with much higher cash flow or carry 
which should lead to a higher total return. In the case of credit REITs, you know, you're lending at wider spreads, um, earning higher yields at lower LTVs. However, so those are the two that we believe have a, a, a more positive outlook. And again, we're, we think we're very fortunate as a firm to have two of those as a, a, our flagship strategies right now. And then two, the, the two that have a darker outlook, at least for the time being, are equity REITs, where you know th- that was a story of income, small amounts of income, but still reasonable income, plus massive NAV appreciation that was then goosed by some of the post-pandemic measures by the Fed and the fiscal stimulus. That's evolved to paltry income with now NAV depreciation, or to be mathematically correct, less income plus NAV depreciation, at least for the next several years, as the real estate market continues to decline. And then perpetual BDCs, you, the good news is income has gone up more than you thought. The bad news is you're going to have more mark-to-market uh, markdowns on loans and also uh, more realized loss. So so again, not not the end of the world, but but a, a not as rosy of an outlook in 23 and 24 than you had coming in 22. So you know, two, two of the five we think look materially better Two of the five look at least modestly darker, um, and and the fifth, it's just more about client timing and investment. And seen it so many times, people allocate to systematic trend followers at the precise wrong time, lose money, don't make money for a while, redeem, and then rinse, repeat. And, and, and by the way, like uh, Mike and Bilana, that that's you could actually say that just about every asset class, right? Like I mean, we were actually looking at at private equity flows, trying to get a handle on how big the private equity secondary opportunity could be. And it's just amazing that like 70, 70, 75% of the capital ever allocated to private equity was from 18 to 22, you know, when you had yeah. much higher valuations, much lower borrowing costs. Uh, have there been a lot of inflows into your managed futures uh, strategy? No. So, so managed futures, we, we do not, we have a very tiny uh, strategy that focuses on that, but the flows that had come into managed futures as an industry were very robust last year because they, they the performance was very was very strong and I I wonder is, right. are the are the trends just not as well defined this year and, and easy to follow do you think yes yeah, so, so the, the the master thesis coming into 23 was it would be very difficult for markets to replicate the degree of trending that you had in 22 right it was just like you, you go through 08 and, and early 09 and and then you get into 2010 to 2012, and you have more range-bound, choppy, sloppy markets. So we, we thought from a return expectation standpoint, you have to lower your return expectations. That being said, we certainly didn't see them getting hit to the degree they have so far this year. The more problematic issue is that you know it was setting up for an exact repeat of what we've seen historically, where you know you have great performance, you have the non negatively correlated return profile, Everyone wakes up and says, "Oh, we, we we should allocate to this," and then they allocate precisely at the exact wrong time. time yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Troy Gajewski, chief market strategist at FS Investments in Honolulu, Vildana. I'm Why so didn't we jealous. meet Troy in Honolulu to do the podcast? He should have told us before. I know it's I his know. fault. Come on, Troy. Next time. Uh, <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, we can't let you go just yet. However, we do have a tradition here on what goes up, where we're going to have to hear. About everyone's craziest thing of the week. Uh, well, Donna, why don't you get us started? I think this is the first time we're talking about this. You and I are working on a new project. Yes. And for that new project, the producers had to interview our family members. <laughs> yes. Did that happen to you too? They yeah, called my sister. They did? Yeah. So I want to give a shout out to my sister, Morella. Who, your sister, Morella. Who, since they interviewed her, she had to go back and listen to a bunch of What Goes Up episodes. And now she is a crazy, craziest things finder. Oh. Like, I mean, the stuff she sends me is amazing. But she always sends it like after the episode airs, so it's always too late. So I'm just going to list a few of the ones. All right, let's hear them. Okay. Tesla made a beer with Cyber Hops. Cyber it's Hops. Giga Beer, B-I-E-R. Wow. Then she sent me... Uh, do you know the store Aldi? Yeah. They have like a clothing line now. Really? Yeah. It looks kind of funky. Then she sent me Coca-Cola bottles with yellow caps because it denotes that they weren't made with corn syrup so that they're Passover friendly. Oh, okay. She's right. just sent me so much stuff. So stuff. I We just might have wanted... a new Crazy Things chief correspondent. I think we do. I mean, she even went to Aldi and took pictures of the stuff. <laughs> 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 Listeners can't right. see it. But anyway, mine is... New York City rat czar. 
<laughs> Did you see this? <laughs> the rat czar? The New York City rat czar is earning $155,000 to lead the rodent fight. Not enough. I would double that. It, I mean, I'm interested to see what happens. Like, He's got to get rid of all the rats? She. She? She. She's got to get rid of them. So that's, is that a new position or is that a standing? No, remember they announced the position a while ago and they just hired this woman who used to be the Department of Education's rat reduction. (laughs) She spearheaded the Department of Education's rat reduction efforts. She's got her work cut out for her. I don't know. She might be a good podcast guest on the. Yeah. I don't know, Trey. That's pretty good. I don't know. It has nothing to do with markets, Vodana, but. Well, it's a salary. I was going to make a joke that it's like one of the jolts. You know, figures that had to, because they hired her, you know. <laughs> the rat. That's funny. 150 grand. Not enough. Not enough to handle all the rats in New York City. Couldn't pay me enough. Dre, how about you? You say anything crazy this week? Well, I'll tell you, the, I think the craziest thing that's happened, you know, that was actionable recently. It's just, you know, we already had these ridiculous levels of industry volatility, you know, with an expectation that, you know, at some point um, we'd have a recession in, you know, when you think about what's been going on in the housing market, it's obviously a downturn. And, and I, I, if you had asked me uh, six weeks ago when I thought inverse IOs, w- which I won't get into all the uh, complex description, but bottom line is they benefit from a steeper yield curve and slower refinance activity, would start to perform even a shadow of what they did from really 08 through 2012. I never would have guessed that. But then you had the mini banking crisis, obviously the Ford curve reprices. Suddenly these securities that had very little or no cash flow have the potential to cash flow uh, pretty significantly. And, and so the massive levels of industry volatility combined with a potential shift in, in Fed direction, um, even a mild one, just caused the, the value of those to, to go up dramatically. And it, it was just something we never saw coming, you know, even six weeks ago. Uh, so it was one of the the few negatively cored expressions that really showed up in terms of performance a lot faster than we would have dreamed of. Interesting. I'll have to look those up. Look those up on the terminal. All right. You like alternative assets, Trey? I, I got this. Is I, I specialize in very very alternative assets. Nice. So, so I here can't you go. wait to hear it. Vildana, uh, are you familiar with? The song Hot for Teacher by Van Halen. No. No? No. Really? No. I am. I know yeah. Troy is. I know <laughs> Troy. I'm a little older than Bill Donna. And I know he's seen the video. Very uh it's a very good video. A lot of production value in the video. I'll I'll leave it at that. But um the guitar Eddie Van Halen was playing in that video. It's like the red guitar with the white stripes across it. Going up for sale at Sotheby's, the Hot for Teacher guitar. It's uh, a Kramer guitar. It was made in, I think, uh, 1982 at the Kramer Green Grove plant in Neptune, New Jersey. Wow. Right near Asbury Park. Interesting, which is something I did not know. It's gone up for sale at Sotheby's, so it's time to play. The Price is Precise. The Price is Precise. I almost said Price is Right. Troy, bad news. You're now a game show contestant on our show, The Price is Precise. I guess I'll phrase it this way. Well, this hasn't gone up for sale, so we're we're dealing with the what Sotheby's expects it to okay. fetch. So we'll we'll go with the high end. Okay. So the first question is do you think more or less than those Air Jordans for two point two million? I've never heard of this song. You never heard of Hoffman no. Teacher? Oh my god, no. Got it bad, got it bad. No. Got it bad. I'll um, have to Hoff look it teacher. up. Come on, Bill No. Man. Very famous song. My guess is gonna be so bad. What do you guess high end estimate for that Kramer guitar? Seventy five thousand dollars. Seventy five thousand dollars. Trey, I'm I'm going. I'm gonna go. Trey, think of all those those heavy metal head fans of ours. No, he's, in te- high school. he's telling you to go higher. Yeah. Oh wait, should I? Yeah, I go higher. Yeah. <laughs> but hey, the, uh, heavy metal guys, they have a lot of money. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, it's a top, it's a narrower market, right? Yeah, it is. It is. You'll go higher? You'll go $75,001? Yes, go higher. They're saying uh, $3 million. What? High end. $3 million. Wow. $3 million. Oh, my God. Two, two to $3 million. The, Put it this way. The opening bid is $1.8 million. So Wow. Just saying, Valdana, you know, if you're looking I don't for understand why. a present for me for my next birthday. 
Your birthday just I'm passed, thankfully. Teacher. Your next birthday isn't for another year. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, if it's still for sale, you know what to get me. Oh, my gosh. I'll look this up. Trace Bear. She's only going 75000 one. And $1. Oh, it's but, but he won. So how for teacher gets hurt. It's a lot of liquidity out there. Talk about asset inflation. Right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, Trey, great to, to hear your thoughts. You told us to sell in May. Maybe we'll bring you back on St. Ledger's Day to see how it went. What do you think? Let's see how it goes. Yeah. yeah. Well, hey, you guys. Great to be on. Thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, getting a little surfing in while I'm out here. Yeah. Wear that sunscreen. I will. Thank <laughs> you, Troy. What goes up? We'll be back next week. Until then, you can find us on the Bloomberg Terminal website and app, or wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love it if you took the time to rate and review the show so more listeners can find us. You can find us on Twitter. Follow me, at Vildana Hyrick. Mike Regan is at Reganonymous. You can also follow Bloomberg Podcasts at Podcasts. What Goes Up is produced by Stacey Wong, and our head of podcasts is Sage Bauman. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next week.